So last week, my really good friend Blaine Bartell was speaking, and he talked about this idea of happiness, and he had these cups, if you remember that, and he talked about how basically happiness is not found in stuff, that happiness is this idea of giving our lives away in service to others. He talked about the, the Beatitudes and this word blessed, that we are blessed when we serve others. So this past week, how did you do? Like, I want you to think about what, what is it, what's one thing you did this past week where you say, man, I, I served somebody in maybe a, a big way or a small way, but you go, wow, that I think brought me more happiness than it brought them. I want you to think about what was that, and I want you to turn to somebody wherever you are in your neighborhood gathering or there in your home, turn to somebody and just take a moment and share that. So we are in the year of rest, and we are kicking off today uh, a year of rest series. It's really our core values series, a series that we're entitling Rest Full, living restful in a restless world. Like right now, do we all not need some rest? Living restful in a restless world is what we're going to be talking about. And we do this every year. If, if you're brand new and, and this is your first time to, to watch us online, this is a perfect time for you to watch because you're going to learn who we are at Core Church. We are driven by our four core values, and our four core values are, are this, hope for the heart, healing for the soul, peace of mind, and purpose in the world. And we didn't just make those up, by the way. That's not something we just came up with. We actually took that from Jesus. Jesus, in the book of Matthew, He gave us what's known as the great commandment. And he basically said this, when somebody said, what are we supposed to be doing in this world? And Jesus answered this way, said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Oh, and a second is equally important, don't forget this one, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's really what drives us as a church. Like we exist because we want you and others around you to find the hope and the healing and the peace and the purpose of Jesus. So today, we're going to look at this word, hope. And if you have a Bible, I want you to go to uh, Psalm chapter 91. Psalm 91, if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to download version. It's a great Bible app. I read out of the New Living Translation. And the Psalms primarily are written by David, but this one here is actually written by Moses. And if you're new to church, Moses is that guy that led the children of Israel out of slavery and gave us the Ten Commandments. Uh, Charlton Heston, think old school, maybe as a kid you watched that. So Moses writes this, and if you read the whole chapter, it's very poetic, and some of it may not make a lot of sense unless you know the story of the children of Israel leaving bondage in Israel, going through the desert, and getting to the promised land, because he uses a lot of poetic language in it. But let's go to Psalm chapter 91, and I want us to read this uh, today as we begin. He says this in, in the first few verses, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. So for a few minutes this morning, I want to talk to you about this idea of resting full of hope. Let's rest full of hope. Let's pray. Father, In the few moments we have together, would you just speak through your word? Would you minister to us in whatever is needed in this moment? In Jesus' name we pray. And wherever you are, will you just say amen together? So in 1803, Lewis and Clark uh, set out on the Corps of Discovery. Uh, They left to uh, find a Northwest Passageway uh, across the Rockies and to the Pacific Northwest. They were trying to make it to the Pacific Ocean. And so they set out from St. Louis, and you probably know this from your history books or your stories, and I've been enthralled with this because I'm reading uh, an autobiography about these guys. 
And they started out kind of in St. Louis, and they went up the Missouri River, and that first leg was a lot more challenging than they really expected. They came across a lot of obstacles, um, a lot of opposition, uh, people trying to stop them. The weather got horrific and awful. And so then they make it to the base of the Rocky Mountains, and their plan is, is to climb the Rockies, and when they climb to the top of the Rockies, that they would find a water route, and they would get in their canoes, and they would just canoe on down to the Pacific Ocean. But you and I know that's not what happened. In fact, when Meriwether Lewis climbed to the top of those mountains and he looked out, instead of seeing a waterway, a river to take them to the Pacific, he saw nothing but mountaintop after mountaintop after mountaintop. And can't even imagine what that moment must have been like for them. And in that moment, they realized they needed to ditch the canoes and they needed to learn how to become mountain climbers. And I, I think right now, in the midst of this pandemic, and you see this whiteboard here, and you're probably wondering, what is this? You probably may not even know it is a whiteboard, but it's a whiteboard. And, uh, and I'm going to draw today. I'm not an artist, so I apologize. I didn't. I tried art. I wasn't any good at it. But if you want to draw this, you can draw it. Maybe it'll help you. But I think right now, a lot of us, we can, we can relate to Lewis and Clark, um, because we're right now trying to navigate this crazy pandemic right now. And it, like most of us have uh, learned the idea of living in our homes and, and what it's like to live in our homes and do school in our homes and work from our homes and, and be locked down in, in our homes. And uh, even our businesses have been kind of shut down. And then we've seen the, um, what's happening in our, in a, on top of the pandemic. We see that there is racial injustice happening in our, in our culture uh, political unrest and rioting and protesting and our cities just seem to be right now in utter turmoil and chaos and it can just feel like this in we we all know this that there was this there was this first wave of covid that hit they hit back in march and we 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 all remember that and the truth is is that i think most of us most of us were we were able to navigate this because we were able to kind of like Lewis and Clark, we, we, on that first leg, we, we were able to, you know, build a boat and, and, and navigate the, the waters, so to speak. And, and we were using, and what I mean by that, by the way, is you're able to use your insight, your wisdom, your, your discernment, your knowledge, your creativity, even, even resources. And it was difficult. It was hard when that first wave hit. But I think most of us, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, you, you've been able to navigate it. I mean, you experience some flooding, okay? We all experience some flooding, and I realize some of us more than others, but, but we were able to navigate it. But how many of you know it's never the first wave that takes you out? It's, it's always that second wave. Like when you go to the beach, you know, and you're playing on the beach, you ever been playing on the beach, you're like, and that wave hits you, and you got your back, you ever have your back to the water, and you're like, whee! And the wave hits you and you're laughing. <laughs> and have you ever been on the beach and seen somebody and you see that second wave coming, but you don't tell them? No, you don't tell them because then they, they turn and that wave just slaps them in the face. And next thing you know, you are eating sand. That's what that second wave can be like. And honestly, I, I think what's happened is we've all seen that second wave come in. I don't know, eight weeks ago, a couple months ago, we all remember when it hit. And it's that second wave that has discouraged so many people. Because it's in that moment where we're like, is this ever going to end? Is this ever going to be over? Is this, I mean, what's going to happen? And am I going to lose my job? What's going to happen? Are my kids going to go back to school? They're back at school. Or are they going to be taken out of school? I, I, I'm using up all the money in my savings. And then we have this political unrest. And we have the, the rioting. And, and, and who's going to get elected? And, and what's going to happen? And it can be so overwhelming. And truthfully... These waves that we call COVID could represent any crisis in our lives, can they not? I mean, if you've been through a divorce, if you've been through a relational a relationship that broke up, if you have dealt with financial hardship, maybe we've been talking about people and their health and struggles they're dealing with in their health, uh, whether it's abuse or, or a betrayal, it's never that first wave that takes you out. It's always that, that second wave that can get you. And for the last six months, I have been really talking about this idea that I believe God is, is trying to get our attention. That I believe God is trying to get us to slow down. 
he's, he's trying to get us to draw close to him and hear his voice because he wants to speak visions. He wants to speak dreams. He, he wants to grow you in your faith and make you strong if we are willing to listen. And, and a couple of weeks ago, we were in our staff prayer, and we do it every Tuesday morning. And so during staff prayer, uh, Sybil Hawkinson, who leads our kids' ministry, she was praying. I don't remember what she prayed, but she said this one word. And when she said this one word, it just hit me. The, the Spirit of God just hit my spirit, and I was like, that is exactly what God is trying to say in this season. And the word that she said, and you might want to write this word down, is the word abide. Abide. So what does that mean to abide? What, is it, what does it mean to abide, and how, how do we abide. I think like Lewis and Clark, we've got to we got to ditch the boats. We got to ditch the boats and we've got to learn how to become mountain climbers. We got to learn how to become mountain climbers. I, I think uh, Moses was a mountain climber. We don't, we don't think of him that way, but Moses often it says withdrew to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai is called the mountain of God. And so many times, that's what Moses would do. He would withdraw to be away with God. And I believe that's what God is calling you and I to do. He's calling us to abide. So what does that look like? Let's look back at the scripture, Psalm 91.1. It says this, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find what? Say it wherever you are. We'll find what? Rest. They will find rest. In other words, they will rest full of hope in the shadow of the Almighty. The New American Standard Version, old school version, says it this way. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High, they will abide. So this idea of abide, abide is to rest. And to rest is to abide. Uh, the, the word that Moses uses here in Psalm 91 for abide or rest, they're interchangeable here. It's this idea of to, to lodge or to, to stay over a night, to, to lodge in place. Uh, Laura and I, whenever we go, whenever we lodge, whenever we go out of town and we stay somewhere, our, our preference, our pref, pref, preference, pref, what's the word? I don't know. Anyway, our, our, our preference, that's the word, preference, thank you. Nobody's helping me here. Our, our preference is to use Airbnb. We love Airbnb. We don't want to stay at a hotel. And if you've ever stayed at an Airbnb, or maybe you've never stayed at Airbnb, let me help you out with this. If you've never stayed at an Airbnb, and there may be a reason, maybe the same reason that I, I am, you usually stay in somebody's house or somebody's apartment. And when you stay, here's a tip for you, you have two options, okay? Here are the two options. You can have the entire place, speaks for itself, you get the entire house, the entire apartment, all to yourself, or you can you can rent from somebody what they call shared space. That means that you get a bedroom, someone else gets a bedroom, and the owner gets the bedroom, and you share the living room, you share the kitchen, you share the bathroom. That ain't my jam. I don't know how you are, but Laura, and Laura, she's the opposite. She loves that. She's like, oh, my gosh, opportunity to make new friends, make new friends, make new friends. She gets so excited about the shared space. She's like, that would be amazing. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't want to wake up in the morning and go down, and Bob's sitting at the kitchen table in his bathrobe, and, you know, in his slippers. I'm like, hey, Bob, could you put some pants on? I, I just don't, I don't have any interest in that. Like, Bob, you know, 2.30 in the morning, waking up, Bob standing over my bed. Mr. Barnesworth, do you need anything? No, that's just weird. I don't need that. Uh, but Laura loves it. She loves this idea of shared space. I think this word abide here, to abide is to have a shared space with God. It's, it's to commune with God. It's this idea of drawing near to God. It's this idea that I'm going to commune with him, that I'm going to pull away from everything else in this world, and I'm going to be with God. I want you to write this down. Hope for the heart is found as I abide in the Almighty. Hope for the heart is found as I abide in the Almighty. Now Moses goes on and he, and he tells us this in the next few verses, that abiding, abiding is about trusting. So if we're going to abide, if we're going to rest, the only way you're going to abide and the only way you're going to rest is if you trust. 
If you don't trust, you'll never abide and you'll never rest. So if you, if you find yourself never pulling away, guess what? It's probably because you don't really trust God. But when we pull away to be with God, when we abide and we rest, it means that we're trusting in God. And Moses trusted fully in God. Look what he says in verse 2. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. I think what happens though so many times right now is that people are, instead of trusting in God, they're trusting in their natural abilities. We talked about that just a moment. They're, they're this idea that I'm just going to build a bigger and better boat. That's how I'm going to overcome that second wave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean more into my wisdom. I'm going to lean more into my creativity. I'm going to lean more into my resources and my insight and my intellect and, and on and on and on, my natural abilities. And I think right now what is happening is people's boats <laughs> are sinking and they're taking on water and people are being overwhelmed and they don't know what to do because it's crashing in on them. But here's the good news. Write this down. When I trust God, he puts his super on my natural. When I trust God, he puts his super on my natural. And here's what happens. When you abide, when you draw into God and you begin to trust him for wisdom, guess what happens? You start climbing the mountain. When you trust him for insight, he puts his super on your natural. When you trust him for supernatural creativity, you start climbing the mountain. When you trust him for supernatural resources, guess what happens? You start climbing the mountain. And when you climb up on the mountain, guess what happens? That second wave, it cannot touch you because you are are abiding in Christ. You're abiding in God. And like Moses says, he becomes your refuge. He becomes your shelter. He becomes your place of safety. He will rescue you from the trap. He will cover you with his feathers. He, he will place you and shelter you under his wings. Hope for the heart is found as we abide in the Almighty. Jesus said this in the New Testament. Matthew wrote this down, this account of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. These are the words of Jesus, and here's how he said it. Come to me. In other words, he says, abide in me. Draw away from all the chaos. Draw away from all of the noise. Draw away from all of the busyness, the heartache, the brokenness, the struggle. Draw away from it. Abide in me. All of you who are weary. And carry heavy burdens. And I will give you what? Rest. I'll give you rest. This idea of rest that Jesus uses is a little different. This word is a little different than the one Moses gives us. The word that Jesus uses here is this word intercession. Or, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, intercession. To take an intercession. Um, or, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. Hang on. And not intercession. Intermission. Take an Intermission. Intercession is what we do when we pray. Intermission. So write down the word intermission. Inter. I'm telling you, I'm not an artist. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. Enter into mission. Okay? I did that on purpose. Stop laughing at me. I did that on purpose. No, but you need to take an intermission. I'll clean that up for the 930 in-person service. But this idea that we need to take an intermission. With this idea of an intermission is to, is to unplug. It's this idea like right now. Jesus is saying this, come to me and I'll give you an intermission. Like all of the noise, all the chaos, all the mess, draw into me and you can take an intermission. You can take a break. I, I love to coach and I'm not sure what this fall is going to look like. I coach 10-year-old boys and whenever I coach 10-year-old boys, it's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It is so chaotic. Um, imagine if you threw five cats on a basketball court and just let them go. 
That's, that's kind of what it's like. I mean, they are running around crazy. They're scratching each other. They're, they're hissing. They're, they're batting at the ball. I mean, they just, it's just chaos. And, chaos. and they, don't, they don't listen. And then on top of that, I've got my assistant coaches that are yelling at them. That, that's coach mom, coach dad, coach grandpa, coach grandma, all yelling at them. There's three courts at one time playing. Imagine this, three courts at one time, noise and craziness. I can tell you as a coach, I try to get them to listen to me in the midst of all that. They can't hear me. So I have to call a timeout, or I have to wait till halftime, and I take an intermission. It's an intermission. It's a moment to pull away, to get them together, away from the noise, and for me to speak to them. This is what God wants to do with you and I. I want you to think about this. What right now feels chaotic to you? What right now in your world is the one thing that you go, this is insane in my life. I don't even know how to navigate this. Just for a moment, let's just stop. I want you to turn to somebody in the gathering that you're at right now, and I want you to share with them what's the one thing that's making you crazy right now. So Core Church, we have these four core values, but we also have our eight core practices. In fact, uh, many of you are going to be gathering in groups tonight and this week, and you're going to be going through these eight core practices that help us to grow as followers of Jesus. If you're not in a group yet, there's still time. We want everybody in a group for the next four weeks where we talk through these eight core practices. But the first two are really about abiding, and I, I want you to write this down. The first one is this, and I'll spell this right this time. I want you to write down daily devotion. Do you have a daily devotion, a time where you stop, where you rest, where you abide? And this is where you learn to trust God in your daily devotion. Listen, so many times if we don't stop and read the word, all we're doing is swimming around in chaos and we're using our own wisdom, our own insight, our own creativity, our own resources. But when you have a daily devotion and you get into the word of God, guess what happens? When you get into the word of God, he begins to put his super on your natural suddenly you have supernatural wisdom supernatural creativity supernatural things begin to happen in those moments where god begins to speak to you a daily devotion the second one is something we're all doing right now and that's sunday worship man i want to tell you what the decision you made today the right decision you decided and you said today i'm going to pull away from the noise I'm going to pull away from the chaos of everything that's going on. And here's what happens when we come together to worship together. Two things happen. Number one, we experience the presence of God. And we experience the power of God. That's what's happening for you right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And, and right now, he is going to supernaturally impart power to you in this moment as we gather together because tomorrow you got to go back out into all of this but because you took time today and because you're daily in the word of God when you come and you abide and you rest and you say I'm going to trust in him you can go back out into this and you rise above all the chaos and all the confusion and all the crisis and all the heartache and all the brokenness that the world says how in the world are you doing this so Lewis and Clark, when they got to that mountain, they didn't give up. They didn't just go, well, I guess that's it. I guess we're just, we're done. No, in that moment, Lewis and Clark, they ditched the canoes, and they became mountain climbers. So my question for you today is this. Are you willing to ditch the canoes? Are you willing to ditch the boat? Are you willing to ditch everything the world is doing? And are you, are you, willing, are you willing to become a mountain climber? Are you willing to abide? Are you, are you willing to, to learn to rest and to trust? Are you willing to withdraw from all of this and go to be with the mountain of God and spend time with God? 